The ascent of money has never been smooth. So long as human expectations of the future veer from the over-optimistic to the over-pessimistic, from greed to fear, stock prices will tend to trace a line not unlike the jagged and irregular peaks of the Andes. As an investor, you just have to hope that when you have to come down from the summit of euphoria, it'll be on a nice, smooth ski slope. Yet in the past year, it seemed as if planet finance has plunged over a sheer cliff. Some of the biggest names on Wall Street and in other financial centers around the world have been wiped out. Well, I want to explain to you just how money rose to play such a terrifyingly dominant role in all our lives. What's more, I want to reveal financial history as the essential backstory behind all history. How the bond market dictated the outcome of the Battle of Waterloo and created the world's greatest financial dynasty. How it ensured the defeat of the South in the American Civil War. How it was that monetary meltdowns made revolutions. We've just witnessed one of the greatest financial crises of all time. 2008 was one of the eight worst years in American stock market history. But even last year's carnage pales into insignificance alongside what happened in France nearly 300 years ago. responsible for the first stock market crash in history was John Law, a renegade Scots murderer who had escaped from Britain via Holland and arrived in France to seek his fortune. By the end of 1719, he had found it. Ensconced in his palatial suite here in the Place Vendôme, that's the Ritz Hotel over there, Law had achieved a greater concentration of financial power in his hands than any individual in all French history. As Controller General of French Finances, he was literally in charge of the collection of all France's indirect taxes, the entire French national debt, the 26 mints that produced the country's gold and silver coinage, the Company of the Indies, better known as the Mississippi Company, which had a monopoly on the import of tobacco, all of France's trade with Africa and Asia, oh, and the Louisiana colony, which covered around a quarter of what is today the United States. In his own right, Law also owned the Mazarin Palace, more than a third of the buildings around the Place Vendôme, more than 12 country estates, several plantations in Louisiana, and a hundred million livres of shares in the Mississippi Company. Not bad going for a man who, when he'd first come here 12 years before, had been identified as a jour, a professional gambler, and a possible spy. By January 1720, Law's triumph seemed complete. A Scots murderer was, in effect, Prime Minister of France. Law's problem was that he had no clear idea where to stop. On the contrary, he had a strong personal interest in printing more money, which his own bank controlled, to drive up the price of his own company's shares. Fortunately for Law, both his bank and his company were now operating out of the very same building, the Mazarin Palace, which he himself happened to own. So all he had to do in order to drive up the company's share price was to take a walk down the corridor from the office where the shares were issued to the office where the money was printed. You could say that Law had become the ultimate insider trader. At root, Law's system was a scam a Ponzi scheme like the one operated by Bernie Madoff. It takes its name from the legendary Italian-American con man, Charles Ponzi. To pay out the generous returns it's promised to the first lot of suckers, 
a Ponzi scheme needs to take in more money from the next lot of suckers. In John Law's scheme, the acquisitions of other companies and the generous dividends Law paid were financed not from company profits, but simply by selling new shares. Like all Ponzi schemes, however, the effect of Law's system was to generate an unsustainable bubble. Law had reflated the French economy with a combination of paper money and public confidence. Now, unfortunately, his bubble was about to go pop. By the beginning of 1720, France was in the grip of a mania, the Mississippi bubble. But the man responsible, the renegade Scots murderer and gambler John Law, who'd risen to become master of the entire French economy, was about to discover an inviolable law of finance. Trees don't grow to the sky. According to Law's PR campaign, the huge profits he was projecting would come from the French colony of Louisiana, which he painted as a veritable Garden of Eden, inhabited by friendly noble savages willing to exchange a cornucopia of exotic goods. These would flow to France through a new city at the mouth of the Mississippi, New Orleans, named to flatter the always susceptible French regent, the Duke of Orléans. All the colony lacked was settlers. Grasping that Frenchmen were more interested in stock market speculation than the hard graft of colonization, Law launched a recruitment drive in the Franco-German borderlands. Several thousand bold Germans signed up and set sail to the promised land. They ended up here. This was the unfortunate immigrant's first glimpse of Louisiana, an insect-infested swamp. Within a year, 80% of them had died of starvation or tropical diseases like yellow fever. Sadly for law, the Mississippi Company's principal asset, its monopoly on trade with Louisiana, looked like being more or less worthless. As the inscription on this Dutch cartoon put it, this is the wondrous Mississippi land, made famous by her share dealings, which through deceit and devious conduct has squandered countless treasures. However men regard the shares, it is wind and smoke and nothing more. To law, economic success was all about confidence. But this, was a confidence trick. In Paris, the first rumors began to circulate that all was not well with Law's system. The share price of the Mississippi Company began to slide. In a desperate bid to avert meltdown, Law called on the Duke of Orléans to cut the official share price from 9,000 livres to 5,000. This was when the limits of royal absolutism, the foundation of Law's system, suddenly became apparent. Within weeks, the share price was in free fall. Angry crowds gathered outside Law's bank. Stones were thrown windows broken. By December, the shares had lost more than 90% of their value. This French map from 1730 gives an absolutely wonderful visual representation of the world's first stock market bubble. Here at the top is the goddess Fortuna pouring down goodies from her horn of plenty. Here are the happy investors receiving their shares in the Mississippi Company from flying cherubs. 
But down below, there are some other cherubs chopping up the shares beside a shattered printing press. And there are two more cherubs blowing bubbles. To the right, there are four very unhappy looking men, one of whom is preparing to commit suicide by falling on his sword. As if pricked by a sword, the Mississippi bubble had now burst. It was at this moment that law, vilified by the French people, fled the country. He never saw his wife and daughter again. He spent the rest of his life in Venice, dividing his time between writing long, self-justifying letters and gambling. He died in 1729. In France, however, his devastating legacy lived on. Law's bubble and bust fatally set back France's financial development, putting Frenchmen off paper money and stock markets for more than a generation. The French monarchy's fiscal crisis went unresolved, and for the rest of the reign of Louis XV and Louis XVI, the crown lived from hand to mouth. Eventually, France was driven by royal bankruptcy to revolution. The revolution of 1789 not only toppled the French monarchy, it also plunged Europe into a succession of bloody wars that lasted from 1792 until 1815. The man who emerged as the greatest warlord of the age was a diminutive Corsican named Napoleon Bonaparte. Less well known is the man who helped finance Bonaparte's ultimate downfall. This house was built by the financial dynasty that helped decide the Battle of Waterloo. The dynasty that produced the man they called the Bonaparte of finance, the emperor of the 19th century bond market. He is master of unbounded wealth. He boasts that he is the arbiter of peace and war and that the credit of nations depends upon his nod. Ministers of state are in his pay. Those words, spoken in 1828 by the radical member of parliament, Thomas Dunscombe, were describing Nathan Rothschild, bond trader extraordinaire and founder of the London branch of what became the biggest bank in the world. The bond market made the Rothschilds stupendously rich, so rich that they could afford to build 41 stately homes all over Europe. This is number 29, Wadsden Manor in Buckinghamshire, which has been restored in all its gilded glory by Jacob Rothschild, Nathan's great, great, great grandson. Well, he was short, fat, obsessive, uh, extremely clever, uh, wholly focused, and um, I can't imagine he would have been a very pleasant person to have uh, had dealings with. Between around 1810 and 1836, the five sons of Meyer Amschel Rothschild rose from the obscurity of the Frankfurt ghetto to attain a position of unequaled power in international finance. It was the third son, Nathan, who orchestrated this family triumph from London. Evelyn de Rothschild is Nathan's great-great-grandson. He recently retired as chairman of Rothschilds, the bank that Nathan built. He was very ambitious and he moved to London and I think he was determined. I don't think he suffered fools lightly. Maybe that's a family trait. This is one of the few surviving letters from Nathan Rothschild to his brothers, written as always in Judendeutsch, that was German, transliterated into Hebrew characters. And it gives you an idea what an extraordinary work ethic the man had and how he tried to impose it on his poor, long-suffering brothers. Just listen to this. Dear Amschel, I'm writing you my opinion because it's my damn duty to do so. I read your letters not once, but often a hundred times, because you can well imagine that after dinner, I don't read books, I don't play cards, I don't go to the theater. 
My only pleasure is my business. It was this phenomenal drive, allied with innate financial genius, that propelled Nathan from obscurity to mastery of the London bond market. But the opportunity for a financial breakthrough came from war. On the morning of June the 18th, 1815, 67,000 British, Dutch and German troops under the Duke of Wellington's command looked out across the fields of Waterloo, not far from Brussels, towards an almost equal number of French troops, commanded by the French Emperor, Napoleon Bonaparte. The Battle of Waterloo was the culmination of more than two decades of intermittent conflict between Britain and France. But it was more than just a battle between two armies. It was also a contest between rival financial systems. One, the French, based on plunder. The other, the British, based on debt. To pay for the war, the British government had sold an unprecedented amount of bonds. According to a long-standing legend, the Rothschild family made their first millions by speculating on how the outcome of the Battle of Waterloo would affect the price of these bonds. Ah! It was this legend of Jewish profiteering that a century later, the Nazis did their best to embroider. In 1940, Joseph Goebbels approved the release of this film, Die Rothschilds. Ich gebe es zu. Nathan is seen bribing a French general to ensure the Duke of Wellington's victory and then deliberately misreporting the outcome of the battle in London. This triggers panic selling of British bonds, which Nathan then snaps up at bargain basement prices. What happened here in 1815 was altogether different. Far from making money from Wellington's defeat of Napoleon, the Rothschilds were very nearly ruined by it. Their fortune was made not by Waterloo, but despite it. This is how it really happened. Selling bonds to the public had raised plenty of cash for the British government. But neither bonds nor banknotes were any use to Wellington. To provision his troops and pay Britain's allies against France, he needed a currency that was universally acceptable. Nathan Rothschild was given the job of taking the money raised in the bond market and delivering it to Wellington as gold. The success of this operation would determine the fate of the warring empires and of all Europe. This letter marks a turning point in the history of both the Rothschild family and the British government. It's dated the 11th of January, 1814, and it's an order from the Chancellor of the Exchequer to the Commissary in Chief, telling him to appoint Nathan Rothschild, Mr. Rothschild, as a British government agent. Nathan's job was to gather together as much gold and silver as he could find on the European continent and make sure that it got to the Duke of Wellington and his army, who had just fought their way out of Spain into the south of France. It was an operation that relied heavily on the Rothschild's unique pan-European credit network and also on Nathan's ability to mobilize gold the way Wellington could mobilize troops. Shifting such vast amounts of gold in the middle of a war was hugely risky, of course. Yet from the Rothschild's point of view, the hefty commissions they were able to charge more than justified the risks. The Rothschilds soon became indispensable to the British war effort. In the words of the British Commissary-in-Chief, Rothschild of this place has executed the various services entrusted to him in this line admirably well, and though a Jew, we place a good deal of confidence in him. The Rothschilds were so effective as war financiers because they had a ready-made banking network within the family. Nathan in London, Amschel in Frankfurt, James in Paris, Karl in Amsterdam, and Salomon roving wherever Nathan saw fit. 
If the price of gold was higher in, say, Paris than in London, James in Paris would sell, and Nathan in London would buy. I think the edge over families like the Barings, with whom they were competing, was that they had their brothers in very important financial centers and countries. Now, whether that was premeditated, whether they thought that through as they got out of the ghetto, it's hard to believe that they went as far as that. But that's what happened. And once they saw that it was an advantage, right, they worked on that advantage. In March 1815, Napoleon returned to Paris from exile in Elba, determined to revive his imperial ambitions. The Rothschilds immediately ramped up their gold operation, buying up all the bullion and coins they could lay their hands on. Nathan's reason for buying this huge stock of gold was simple. He assumed that, as with all Napoleon's wars, this would be a long one. His gold would be more and more sought after, and it would rise in value. It proved to be a near-fatal miscalculation. Wellington famously called the Battle of Waterloo the nearest run thing you ever saw in your life. After a day of brutal charges, countercharges, and heroic defense, the late arrival of the Prussian army finally proved decisive. For Wellington, it was a glorious victory. But not for the Rothschilds. No doubt it was gratifying to Nathan Rothschild to be the first to hear the news of Napoleon's defeat. Thanks to the swiftness of the Rothschild couriers, he heard it fully 48 hours before Major Henry Percy delivered Wellington's official dispatch to the British cabinet. But no matter how early he heard it, the news from Waterloo was anything but good from Nathan's point of view. He had bargained for something much more protracted. Now he and his brothers were sitting on top of a pile of cash that nobody wanted to pay for a war that was over. With the coming of peace, the great armies that had fought Napoleon could be disbanded. That meant no more gold for soldiers' wages, and it meant the price of gold, which had soared during the war, would fall. Nathan was faced with heavy and growing losses. There was only one possible way out. Nathan could use the Rothschild gold to make a massive and hugely risky bet on the bond market. On July the 20th, 1815, the evening edition of the London Courier reported that Nathan had made great purchases of stock, meaning British government bonds. Nathan's gamble was that the British victory at Waterloo would send the price of British bonds soaring upwards. Nathan bought, and as the price of bonds began to rise, he kept on buying. Despite his brother's desperate entreaties to sell, Nathan held his nerve for another year. Eventually, in July 1817, with bond prices up by 40%, he sold his holding. His profits were worth approximately 600 million pounds today. The Rothschilds had shown that bonds were more than just a way for governments to fund their wars. They could also be bought and sold in a way that generated serious money. And with money came power. Meyer Amschel Rothschild had repeatedly admonished his five sons, if you can't make yourself loved, make yourself feared. As they bestrode the mid-19th century financial world as masters of the bond market, the Rothschilds were already more feared than loved. But now, they had become hated too. The fact that the Rothschilds were Jewish gave a new impetus to deep-rooted anti-Semitic prejudice. 
Just a few months ago, a colleague of mine in my office who collects posters uh, found these, uh, well, this particular rather extraordinary example of anti-Semitism in a stark form about the Rothschilds, who were sort of epitomized to them and others at times uh, the most extreme forms of undesirable cap capitalism as practiced by Jews. It was above all the Rothschild's seeming ability to permit or prohibit wars that aroused the most indignation. You might have thought that the Rothschilds actually needed war. After all, some of Nathan's biggest deals had been produced by war. And if it hadn't been for war, 19th century states wouldn't have needed to issue any bonds for the Rothschilds to buy and sell. But the trouble with war, and even more so with revolution, was that it increased the risk that a debtor state might fail to meet its commitments, and that hit the price of existing bonds. By the mid-19th century, the Rothschilds were no longer mere traders. They were fund managers, carefully tending to a vast portfolio of their own government bonds. Now, they stood to lose much more than to gain from conflict. The Rothschilds had helped decide the outcome of the Napoleonic Wars by putting their financial weight behind Britain. Now they would help decide the outcome of the American Civil War ah! by choosing to sit on the sidelines. Fifty years after the Battle of Waterloo, and on the other side of the world, another great war would be decided by the power of the bond market. But this time, it would be the vanquished who made the big bet and lost. There is a view that the key turning point in the American Civil War came in mid-1863, when Union forces captured Jackson, the Mississippi state capital, and forced a Confederate army to retreat westward to Vicksburg, their backs to the Mississippi River. There, surrounded by a Union army and with Union gunboats bombarding their positions from the river, the Southerners held out for a month before finally laying down their arms on July the 4th. After Vicksburg, the Mississippi was firmly in the hands of the North. The South was literally split in two. Yet this military setback wasn't the decisive factor in the South's ultimate defeat. The real turning point came earlier, and it was financial. Two hundred miles downstream from Vicksburg, where the Mississippi joins the Gulf of Mexico, lies the port of New Orleans. This is Fort Pike, built after 1812 to protect New Orleans from a future British attack. But 50 years later, it wasn't able to protect the South from a northern attack when Captain David Farragut seized New Orleans on April the 28th 1862. It was a crucial moment in the Civil War because New Orleans was the principal outlet for the South's most important export. Cotton. Without control over the cotton trade, the South's cause was doomed. Because cotton had become the essential ingredient in an ambitious scheme to bring the bond market into the war. Like the Italian city-states 500 years before, the Confederate Treasury had initially raised money for the war by selling bonds to its own citizens. But there was a finite amount of capital available in the South. To survive, the Confederacy looked to Europe in the hope that the world's greatest financial dynasty might help them beat the North, as they had helped Wellington beat Napoleon. Initially, the Confederacy had grounds for optimism. 
In New York, the Rothschilds agent was a Northern Democrat, August Belmont, who opposed the Republican Abraham Lincoln in the presidential election of 1860 and would do so again four years later. But still the Rothschilds hesitated. Lending to the British government to help defeat Napoleon had been one thing, but buying bonds from a bunch of breakaway southern slave states seemed a risk too far. The Rothschilds decided to stay out. Yet despite this setback, the Confederate government had an ingenious trick up their sleeves. The trick, like the sleeves themselves, was made of cotton. The South's idea was to use cotton as collateral to back its bonds. Investors would be comforted to know that even if the interest payments dried up, they could still demand their cotton instead. The South's agents went to work selling the bonds in the financial centers of Europe. When the Confederacy tried to market conventional bonds in European financial centers like Amsterdam's, investors wouldn't touch them with a barge pole. But when an obscure French firm named Emil Erlanger & Company offered cotton-backed bonds, it was a completely different story. The key to the success of the Erlanger bonds was that they could be converted into cotton at the pre-war price of six pence a pound. These cotton bonds formed the basis of the South's new financial strategy. If they could restrict the supply of cotton, its value and the value of the bonds would increase. At the same time, the Confederates set out to use cotton to blackmail the most powerful country in the world, Britain. In 1860, the Port of Liverpool was the principal gateway for imports of cotton to the British textile industry, then the mainstay of the Victorian industrial economy. More than 80% of the cotton came from the southern United States. Now, that gave the Confederate leadership hope that they had the leverage to bring in Britain on their side in the Civil War. To ratchet up the pressure, they decided to impose an embargo on all shipments of cotton to Liverpool. For a while, the South's strategy worked brilliantly. Cotton prices soared. So did the value of the Confederates' cotton-backed bonds. And the cotton embargo devastated the British economy. Mills were forced to lay off workers. Eventually, in late 1862, production all but ceased. This cotton mill in Style, south of Manchester, employed around 400 workers, but that was just a fraction of the 500,000 people employed by King Cotton across Lancashire. Obviously, with no cotton, there was nothing for people to do. By the end of 1862, half the entire workforce of Lancashire had been laid off. A quarter of the population was on poor relief. They called it the Cotton Famine. But this really was a man-made famine. Britain was in the doldrums, and the South's cotton bonds were riding high. Yet the South's ability to manipulate the bond market depended on one overriding condition, that investors could be sure of taking physical possession of the cotton which underpinned the bonds if the South failed to make its interest payments. And that's why the fall of New Orleans on April the 28th, 1862, was the real turning point in the American Civil War. Now that the South's main port was in Union hands, any investor who wanted to lay his hands on Southern cotton had to run the Union's formidable naval blockade. The Confederates had overplayed their hand. They had turned off the cotton tap, but then lost the ability to turn it back on. 
1863, the mills of Lancashire had found new sources of cotton in China, Egypt, and India. And investors were rapidly losing faith in the South's cotton-backed bonds. The consequences for the Confederate economy were disastrous. With its domestic bond market exhausted and only two paltry foreign loans, the Confederacy really had no alternative but to print paper dollars, like these ones here in the Louisiana State Museum, to pay for the war. In all, $1.7 billion worth. Now, it's true that the North also printed paper money, but by the end of the war, its greenbacks were still worth around 50 pre-war cents, whereas a Southern grayback was down to just one cent. What's more, with more and more of this cash chasing fewer and fewer goods, inflation in the South simply exploded. By January 1865, the price of some goods was up by a factor of 90. The Rothschilds, meanwhile, who had refused to back the Confederate bonds and so hastened the South's demise, had amassed so much money that their wealth had become proverbial. As the poet Heinrich Heine observed, money is the god of our time, and Rothschild is his prophet. Heine was also struck by the way that financial wealth, personified by the Rothschilds, posed a revolutionary challenge to the old wealth of the European aristocracy. Property ownership was once the preserve of an aristocratic elite. Estates were passed down from father to son, along with titles and political privileges. Everyone else was a mere tenant, paying rent to their landlord. Even the right to vote in elections was originally a function of property ownership. In one respect, not much has changed in Britain since those days. Of 60 million acres of British land, around 40 million are owned by just 189,000 families. The difference is that they no longer monopolise the political system. Indeed, thanks to reform of the House of Lords, the hereditary peerage is being phased out of Parliament. Now, you can explain the decline of the aristocracy in many ways, but as far as I'm concerned, the main driver was finance. Until the 1830s, fortunes smiled on the British land-owning elite. The 30 or so families with gross annual income from their lands above £60,000 a year, roughly £150 million today. With such vast property assets backing them and income from agriculture booming, it was hard to see how the aristocracy could fail to flourish. Yet by ignoring a fundamental truth about property, they ensured their own decline. Like many of us today, the great magnates saw the value of their property as a cash cow and used it to borrow to the hilt, often more than the property was worth. What they'd fail to understand is that property is only a security to the person who lends you money. As a borrower, you still have to earn the money to pay back the loan. And for the great landowners of Victorian Britain, that suddenly became a very difficult thing to do. Nowhere was the pain more acute than here in the heart of rural Buckinghamshire. There's something undeniably magnificent about this huge neoclassical palace, Stowe House, arguably the greatest private residence built in England in the 18th century. Just look at these extraordinary scagliola pillars or the stunning elliptical plaster ceiling. And yet there seems to be something missing, or rather many things, because once in each of these alcoves there was a Roman statue. The 
exquisite Georgian fireplaces have been ripped out and replaced by bog standard ones like this. Why? How did this most stately of stately homes become a mere shell of its former self? The answer is that this house belonged to the principal victim of the first modern property crash. Richard Plantagenet, Temple Nugent, Bridges Chandos Grenville, second Duke of Buckingham. Stowe was only part of the Duke's vast empire of real estate. In all, he owned around 67,000 acres in England, Ireland and Jamaica. These immense properties seemed more than adequate to back his extravagant lifestyle, and he spent money as if it might go out of fashion, on mistresses, on illegitimate children, on anything that he felt was compatible with his standing as a Duke of the Realm. By 1845, the jig was up. Grain prices had begun their long slide downwards, and so had the income from agricultural land. Rural property prices plummeted. Suddenly, the aristocracy found that their borrowings had outrun the value of their estates. The Duke was spending far more than his income, and most of that was being absorbed by interest payments. But there was to be one final bout of conspicuous consumption. In preparation for a visit by Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, the Duke decided to splash out and refurbish Stowe House from top to bottom. Fifteen saloons were stuffed full of the most expensive furniture that money could buy. The floorboards were groaning under the weight of Genoa velvet, embroidered satin and gold brocade. When the Queen saw the results, she commented rather waspishly, I am sure I have no such splendid apartments in either of my palaces. Sadly, the cost of this mega makeover proved to be the final straw for the ducal finances. In August 1848, to the Duke's horror, his son had the entire contents of Stowe House auctioned off. Now, his ancestral stately home was thrown open for throngs of bargain hunters to bid for the silver, the wine, the china. Today, Stowe is a private boarding school. It's a poignant symbol of the transience of landed wealth. In the modern world, it turned out, a regular job and a steady income mattered more than an inherited title, no matter how many acres you owned. Divorced by his long-suffering and much-betrayed Scottish wife, whose entire wardrobe had been seized by sheriff's officers in London, the Duke was finally forced to relinquish Stowe and move into rented accommodation. He eked out his days at his club, the Carlton, writing a succession of highly unreliable memoirs and incorrigibly chasing actresses and other men's wives. <laughs> the fall of the Duke of Buckingham was a kind of harbinger for a new democratic age in which every adult would be given the vote, whether they owned a stately home or paid rent for a humble flat. As aristocratic fortunes from agriculture declined, so the franchise was widened. Yet the rise of new money in place of old landed wealth was only one of the changes brought about by finance in the 19th century. Almost as important was the dramatic overseas expansion of the European empires. It used to be said that emerging markets were places where they have emergencies. Investing in faraway places can make you rich, but when things go wrong, it's often been a fast track to financial ruin. That's why many of today's apparently unstoppable emerging markets are really re-emerging markets. These days, of course, the ultimate re-emerging market is China. 
to talk to some people, there's simply no limit to the amount of money to be made here. And it's certainly true that over the past 20 years, the mainland has followed the example set here in Hong Kong and boomed. And yet this isn't the first time that foreign investors have piled into China, aiming to make megabucks from the world's most populous nation. And the last time, those foreign investors lost almost as many shirts as the local tailors here can stitch together in a week. The key problem with overseas investment, then as now, is that it's hard for an investor in London or New York to see what a foreign government or company is up to when they're an ocean or more apart. If the foreign borrower decides to default on its debts, what's an investor to do? The answer before 1914 was brutally simple but effective. Get your government to send in the Navy. By guaranteeing European political control, gunboat diplomacy provided reassurance for British investors even at the remotest extremities of the world economy. The Royal Navy provided the far power that underwrote the first age of globalization. And its pioneers, like William Jardin and James Matheson. Jardin and Matheson were buccaneering Scots who'd set up a trading company in the southern Chinese port of Canton in 1832. Not to put too fine a point on it, their most profitable line of business was drug dealing. They shipped opium produced under British government control in India to China's population of addicts, a trade that China's emperor had banned. On March the 10th, 1839, an imperial official named Lin Zhezhu arrived in Canton under orders from the emperor to stamp out the trade. He besieged the British opium warehouses, blocking any further imports. 20,000 chests of opium valued at two million pounds were confiscated and literally thrown in the sea. Faced with catastrophic losses, Jardin hurried to London to lobby the British government to send a gunboat. Well, Jardin got his wish granted. On August the 23rd, 1840, British gunships landed here on Hong Kong Island. The Qing Empire was about to feel the full force of history's most successful narco state. As Jardin had predicted, the Royal Navy made short work of the Chinese defences. With southwestern China under British control, the opium trade was given free reign. Drug addiction exploded. Large tracts of the country slid into rebellion and anarchy. But for Jardin Matheson, with their head office now established in Hong Kong, the glory days of Victorian globalization had arrived. By 1900, the firm had diversified into more respectable lines of business. It had its own breweries, its own cotton mills, its own insurance company, and its own railways, like the one they built from Kowloon to Canton. Back in 1913, an investor in London had an extraordinary range of foreign opportunities, and nothing illustrates that better than the ledgers of N. M. Rothschild and Sons. Just a single page from 1913 lists no fewer than 20 different foreign securities, including bonds issued by Chile, Egypt, Germany, Hungary, Italy, not forgetting 11 different railway companies, including four from Argentina, two from Canada, and down here, the good old Kowloon to Canton railway line. For the first time in history, the world economy was truly united by a combination of low trade and high finance. Yet this first era of financial globalization was to be brought to a violent halt by the world's first truly global conflict. On June the 28th, 1914, 
the heir to the Austrian throne, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, was assassinated in the Bosnian capital, Sarajevo. Initially, financial markets shrugged off the news as just another bout of Balkan bloodshed. In reality, the assassination had sparked off a chain reaction in the world's financial markets. As investors belatedly grasped the likelihood of a full-scale European war, liquidity, the ability to borrow money or sell assets, was sucked out of the world economy as if the bottom had dropped out of a bath. The resulting disruption to international finance shattered globalization. It's absolutely fascinating to follow the outbreak of the First World War through the financial pages of the London Times. It wasn't until July the 22nd, 1914, that anybody appreciated that the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo, three weeks before, might have some financial repercussions. Just 10 days later, on August the 1st, 1914, the Times had to report the closure of the stock exchange, and closed it remained until January the 4th, 1915. Why were investors so seemingly oblivious to Armageddon just days before the outbreak of World War? Well, the answer is that a combination of financial innovation and global integration had made the world seem reassuringly safe. The lights in financial markets were flashing green, not red, until the very eve of destruction. There may be a lesson here for our time, too. Financial globalization Mark I took a generation to engineer, but it was blown apart in a matter of days. And it would take more than a generation to repair the damage done by the guns of August 1914. So is there nothing we can do to protect ourselves from the threat of financial disaster? Next time on The Ascent of Money, we'll see that finance is as much about risk as it is about return. The big question is, are you insured or are you hedged? Next time on The Ascent of Money, saving up for the proverbial rainy day is the first principle of insurance. How should we deal with the risks and uncertainties of the future? This wall of water had to be maybe 15 to 20 feet tall. And moving fast. Moving quickly, just coming down this boulevard and just taking everything with it as it would come. The world can be a dangerous place. Are you insured? The Ascent of Money, a financial history of the world.